thanks, Paul, and thanks for organizing this this amazing class and the group Toronto Pig Save and particularly Toronto Cow Save, which formed afterwards, was actually founded by many people. Um, but Pig Save, I just want to credit. Uh, whoops. There, I want to credit Mr. Bean because uh, my dog, a dog that I adopted for my mom, um, a little over two years ago, and. Uh, I had lived in the neighborhood of a slaughterhouse called Quality Meat Packers for many years, and I knew about the slaughterhouse, and I always said, oh, somebody should do something about it. And I only thought about it a few times a year because I only saw the slaughterhouse. I walked by it a few times a year. But when I adopted Mr. Bean from Animal Alliance of Canada's Project Jesse, um, we walked on Lakeshore every morning, and I, we saw the trucks every day. So we saw like eight, nine trucks during a half hour, one hour walk. So that really got to me, and then that's when Pig Save formed. So I, I always credit him as a co-founder, and he, he totally deserves credit for founding the group because he put us in touch with our community. And I think animals often do that, especially dogs, because you walk your dog. So I just wanted to set the record straight on, on that. So um, today I wanted to talk about um, the ideas of bearing witness and community organizing and using multimedia art and so forth, but going back to prophets like Ramakrishna. He was a 19th century prophet. Tolstoy, who lived the, he was born in 1828, died in 1910, and strongly influenced Gandhi. Uh, there's several books on how much he influenced Gandhi in terms of nonviolence and also personal transformation. And, and, and then King, who was strongly influenced by Gandhi in turn. He had a portrait of Gandhi in his, in his office. And Cesar Chavez, he was uh, also an advocate of nonviolence, and he founded the United Farm Workers, and he was also a vegetarian, as was Tolstoy and Gandhi, and I think Ramakrishna. Not King, but Coretta Scott King, his wife, became a vegan last 10 years of her life, and one of their sons, Dexter, is a, is a vegan for the reasons of nonviolence. So um, what I wanted to talk about first were uh, these social movement leaders who, and some of their thinking, and then talk about the specifics of Toronto Pig Safe and its approach to bearing witness and community organizing and so forth. So before I talk about um, their ideas of nonviolence and how they try to transform society, I want to talk about personal transformation and how that's just as important as social transformation in their lives. So... Um, Everything from the idea of emptying your own chamber pot. And I wanted to quote, there's a really nice biography of Tolstoy by A.N. Wilson. And I just want to quote a bit how, how Tolstoy thought it was very important that people empty their own chamber pots. He was an aristocrat, and his wife, Sonia, strongly objected to this. Um, and in India, it was the untouchables that always emptied chamber pots. So it was a class issue. And in, in all societies, it's a class issue of who gets to empty the chamber pots. So these social movement leaders who believed in nonviolence and equality believed that everybody should be responsible for their own mess, basically. Um, so I just wanted to quote a bit here from him. Um, he had an English visitor, uh, Tolstoy and, and his wife, Sonia, Desmond McCarthy. And... Uh, he, McCarthy says how friendly he was and uh, inviting him. And then Tolstoy liked, and then he says, Tolstoy liked his guests to empty their own chamber pots. He felt that it was demeaning to ask the servants to perform the office, this office on anyone else's behalf. McCarthy agreed that he would empty his own slops, and Tolstoy shuffled off down the corridor. Then it says how his wife came afterwards and said, no, 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 don't do that. You know, somebody will clean it up for you. But anyways, this was a really important principle for Tolstoy. So I just want to show you then how this is actually going to be a theme for um, Gandhi as well. You'll see. Um, the other thing that Tolstoy is famous for is he dressed like the peasants. As many of you may know, he was a rich aristocrat, big landowner, had thousands of serfs. And towards the end of his life, he had a transformation uh, around 1870. Uh, sorry, around 1880. So for the last 30 years of his life, he, he sort of uh, had this, he, 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 he dressed like the poor and he would work in the fields with the serfs. 
And I'm just going to show that also became a very important principle for Gandhi. And we'll, we'll look at that. Um, the other thing is uh, the idea of living like the poor, or better yet, living simply and becoming self-sufficient. That was also an important principle in Tolstoy's life and Gandhi's. And uh, King as well. And um, so, OK. So um, just wanted to highlight that uh, Tolstoy dressed like peasants. He made his own shoes. He cleaned his own chamber pot. He asked guests to clean up their own chamber pots. Um, Gandhi stopped wearing Western suits um, while he was still in South Africa uh, in order to look like the indentured, uh, indentured workers, which he was fighting for. That, that was, that, 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 those were the Indian indentured workers in South Africa. Then in 1921, he started wearing nothing but a loincloth, and that was what the untouchables wore. Um, um, in his, at Gandhi's ashrams, he set up a number of ashrams in his lifetime. So in South Africa, he set up Phoenix Farm, or, uh, which was uh, uh, in, um, near Durban. And then he set up Tolstoy Farm, which was just outside of Johannesburg. And everyone cleaned their own latrines. He, he engaged in, people engaged in spinning, so they made their own clothes. He, they made their own sandals. They did their own, he did his own laundry. He cut his own hair. Um, many of you know from watching the movie Gandhi that he, when he went to South Africa as a lawyer, he went, he traveled first class on a train and then was pushed off. You probably remember that. Uh, but by 1914, he started traveling only third class, again, in solidarity with the poor. Um, in the case of Cesar Chavez, who started this uh, United Farm Workers, he, his, his salary was similar to the low-wage farm workers for whom he engaged in community organizing. He never owned a car all his life. So it was just a way of expressing, again, a way of expressing solidarity with the class you're working with and not living in luxury while you're trying to organize poor people. Um, so I just, now I want to look at sort of some of broader questions with respect to nonviolence and the idea of bearing witness. But I, I really wanted to start with a personal and showing how they made, you know, what you might call sacrifices or how they tried to live in line with the, the people that they were uh, or, organizing. Um, but, so now let's look at social transformation. Um, with respect to these, this idea of bearing witness, uh, what they would do is they would go to the sites of greatest injustice, and that's what that's going to be a theme as I look at um, Ramakrishna, uh, Gandhi, and King. So let's start with uh, Ramakrishna. Um, he visited a famine-struck area with a, I'll just show you a picture here. Here it is. Uh, uh, a famine-stricken area with a wealthy landowner, and the landowner said, well, you know, what can I do? How can I help? It's just a, you know, a drop in the bucket. I can't do anything. Then Ramakrishna said that he would refuse to move uh, and, and live, you know, and, and, and live with the poor until something was done to help them. So I just think that's a very strong form of bearing witness. Um, he said he would share their fate rather than, um, you know, just look the other way or not get involved. Um, in the case of uh, Gandhi, in the case of Tolstoy, sorry, um, he, there was a major famine in Russia in 1892, and his whole family uh, set aside more than a year setting up um, over 200 soup kitchens, um, makeshift hospitals, and kindergartens. So he, he was this, you know, this major author, yet when there was a crisis, that's what he did. His whole family, his sons. In fact, his sons first witnessed the, he hadn't been involved in the famine, he knew about the famine, and his sons had seen it and told him about it, then within two days, he took action as well. And, and all, his whole family played a role. So for example, his wife was also on site, but she was also doing fundraising. And the Quakers in the United States, for example, sent a shipload of food, uh, there were like several ships of food that was sent from Philadelphia. Um, and uh, 
so, it also, so let's now, uh, in the case of king, um, bearing witness, wh what did it mean? Um, he was offered many jobs when he just finished his education. He, and his wife, Coretta Scott King, was a singer, and she had a lot of opportunities. But they together decided to move to Montgomery in the south, even though it was a segregate, it still suffered from segregation, and they would be bringing up their children in that context. But they decided to do that because they wanted to be involved. So rather than go to a northern city and you know develop her career and his career and not have to deal with the issue of segregation, they consciously decided to move to Montgomery. Um, and in terms of choosing the worst sites, at one point, you know, they had success at, in the Montgomery campaign. They then went to Birmingham. Birmingham is in Alabama, and it's the most, it was the most segregated city in the United States. There were more cases of unsolved burnings of churches and homes than in any other place, but they consciously decided to open up a campaign there. Um, and then later, once they achieved certain successes in the civil rights movement, such as the passage of the Civil Rights Act, uh, they opened up another front in the campaign and uh, addressed the issue of housing discrimination in Chicago. So his whole family moved in 1966 to a slum tenement in Chicago. And uh, th as, soon as, you open, as soon as you went into the hallways, it smelled of urine. The reason it smelled of urine is that there were no locks on the doors, so homeless people would just urinate in the halls. And, um, so, uh, and they also noticed that their children sort of changed because they were living in a ghetto now. And so, you know, they picked up different language, different, you know, attitudes kind of thing. But here's another example of, of bearing witness involving one sort of changing their live, lives and moving into a situation of great injustice. So I bring this all up because our group, Toronto Pig Save, Toronto Cow Save, uh, we bear witness. And some people think, oh, that's a great <laughs> sacrifice. You know, we, we go there, we see the animals and the transport trucks on their way to slaughter. But how close are we actually, you know, uh, empathizing with the animals and their suffering? You know, uh, how, how much closer can we get in terms of trying to stop the injustice? I only bring this historical context up because in history, social movements and social movement leaders have done a lot more in terms of bearing witness. So I just want to just put things into context. I think uh, we have the example in China where a lot of activists actually stop transport trucks and find homes, rescue the, the dogs and cats that are being sent to slaughter and find homes. And sometimes have to pay fifteen, sixteen hundred dollars for the, the car, the, you know, the truckload of animals. So they take, that's an example of bearing witness in a more, in a fuller sense than what we are doing. Okay. The other themes that I'm going to talk about when I talk, go over some of King's, Gandhi's and King's contribution is that they, they, they said that two things were most important in life, and that's truth and love. And, you know, in the case of Tolstoy, it, it, it applied to animals and, and Gandhi as well. Um, I am going to talk about a deontological approach versus utilitarian approach. Deontological just means doing the right thing every moment, whereas a consequentialist approach means you're calculating <clears throat> the outcomes and you know you're you're ju you're judging your actions based on what the outcomes are going to be, or you think or you think they're going to be. Um, I'm also going to talk about turn the other cheek and how and lo loving your adversary. So God, the Gandhian approach is known as a love-based approach, and we're going to talk about what it means in terms of. Um, turning the other cheek and loving loving your adversary. Um, in terms of community organizing and what we can learn from these other movements, uh, for Gandhi, he said, you always start with moral principles. Uh, you first appeal to the opponent. He never called them enemies. He just called, you know, the opponent. You approach the opponent and appeal to to them in terms of the ethics of the situation. Like, what is the right thing to do? And if they, you know, they don't decide to act for justice, then you escalate the campaign. Yeah, I mean, you always try to negotiate and, and you negotiate by put, putting pressure on them. And one way of putting pressure on them is non-cooperation with evil. So that could mean withdrawing economic support. So in the case of the animal movement, like not supporting businesses that exploit animals. 
Uh, then you can escalate it further, and Paul York has talked a lot about civil disobedience, and that's something that the animal rights movement needs to consider as an option as well. And in terms of their approach to community organizing, what I wanted to emphasize is that, as you can tell from what I said about their ideas about personal transformation, is that they were very humble, and in their view, everyone is a foot soldier, so there are no rock stars in the movement. Like, everyone's a foot soldier, everyone has to clean the latrines kind of thing. You know, or put in our context, that means putting away the chairs. If there's an event, there's no rock stars. We all help, you know, set up the th set up an event and clean clean up after ourselves. Um, and also, everyone is a leader, and that's a really important concept in a community organizing approach. Is that everyone is a leader, and 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 a good leader brings out the leadership potential in others, and nurtures leadership. And it's a very cooperative, not a competitive kind of uh, movement. And finally. Uh, the, the, this idea of developing a sustained mass-based democratic organization. Um, it's going to be sustained if, if you work on the personal relationships, if you, you, know, you encourage, if it's based on kindness and, 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 you know, uh, and respect and support and you know, nurturing leadership and all that, then I think you have the potential of really building a, a huge movement. I just uh, wanted to quote Martin Luther King here. He said, um, I believe that unconditional love will have the final world word in reality. And that's what he said when he received a Nobel, Nobel Prize in uh, peace. Okay, so I just wanted to go in a little more detail uh, in terms of Gandhi's life. So he, he lived simply at Phoenix Ashram and Tolstoy Farm, and these were set up in South Africa. So Tolstoy Farm was outside Johannesburg, and um, Phoenix Farm was outside Durban. And one of the reasons that they set up these ashrams was to publish a newspaper, The Indian Opinion, which was, pu which was published in four languages. Um, so it was basically a Buddhist ashram. It was a uh, vegetarian. Um, he, uh, one of the biographers, uh, his biographers, Rachel Bladen, writes, he had a Tolstoyan preoccupation of lat latrines. He made inspection of latrines his special task. Um, he cleaned his own chamber pot when he, at the age of 30. So that's when it started. And as I mentioned, he, he did his own cooking, cut his own hair, and so forth. Um, at one point, uh, if you watch the movie Gandhi, you, you probably remember he had a fight with his wife, Castor Bay, over the cleaning of a chamber pot, where he actually, like, he was really upset, and he may have even pushed her, and he sort of, you know, violated his principle of nonviolence kind of thing. Um, they fought a lot, apparently. Yeah, they, yeah, they often had different values, and occasionally, um, they worked in tandem too. Occasionally, like she even got, went to jail at some in part, some points in her life as well. And she, in fact, she died in jail, which was very sad. Uh, um, Tolstoy was very much influenced by the book "The Kingdom of God Is Within You," which was on the reading list for today. Um, it's a book about turning the other cheek, about nonviolence, and. Tolstoy wrote the book uh, based on William Lloyd Garrison, who was, a anti, who, was an, uh, who was an abolitionist and a journalist. And he, his, if you read biographies on him, he emphasized turning the other cheek. So very much influenced by that sort of Christian principle, sort of Jesus principle or Buddhist principle of, not, of the opposite of an eye for an eye, but rather just turning the other cheek. Um, at these, at these, at this ashram, uh, basically they ate raw food, and I thought that was something Michael might appreciate. Uh, so they ate meals consisting of bananas, lemons, dates, and raw ground nuts. Um, they treated everyone as equals. They wouldn't have servants. They made their own clothing, including sandals. They accepted no gifts of value. Um, there, you might remember. Uh, how he, he did, one of the fights that they, he had with his wife was over jewelry. He didn't want her to have any jewelry and didn't accept any gifts of jewelry. Okay. Okay. Uh, 
Okay. Um, I just wanted to go over some of the issues he had with respect to, uh, again, um, this uh, cleaning uh, latrines. I, I know I'm emphasizing this a lot, but it actually was an important part of his life. Um, when he moved to India and set up, um, he, was in, he was in South Africa for about 20 years, where, and where he developed Satyagraha, the idea of, not, of active resistance. Um, and he had some major campaigns. But um, when, when he moved back to India around 1914, um, there was a point where a lot of the people who had lived on Phoenix settlement uh, in, India, in South Africa went with him to live in the ashram in India. And they, he, he got a group together that would work as scavengers, scooping up excrement and shoveling dirt over open pits of the latrines. And he would also accept uh, tanners who were basically untouchables in his ashram. This was all controversial. He actually stopped getting funding from some people because he did that. Because he, uh, the two things that he worked on in India were the struggle for independence and um, the freedom for the untouchables. And he worked on the issue of freedom for untouchables largely because of his experience in South Africa, where he had worked with the poor, the indentured Indian laborers. He didn't work for um, people of color, black, black South Africans, unfortunately. He wasn't very progressive. He, he only had like a couple of friends that were actually black. He, he was living in South Africa for 20 years. <laughs> but he did work very hard on the, um, for the poor, poor Indians who were indentured laborers. So based on his experience, he took that to, to India. And if you look at the Congress Party, which was fighting for independence in India, they would not touch the issue of untouchability. They didn't think it was an issue because they just wanted to focus on independence from Brit British imperialism. But he said, no, that was as important. You have to look at your own society and the injustices you're perpetrating and try to address those as well. So I think that's a very honorable thing that he did. And uh, I just wanted to relate another story in 1942 there had been violence. There was a lot of sec religious sectarian violence in India in 1942 between uh, um, Muslims and Hindus and in a region that's currently Bangladesh. And so Gandhi went there after there was violence in order to encourage communal peace. Uh, and one of the things he did, and I, I want to quote here from um, a book called The Great Soul, which just re recently came out, which is a biography of Gandhi. Uh, strongly recommended. He said, Gandhi removed feces with dry leaves. Manu, who was a cousin of his, complained of the shame he was bringing me. And then Ma Mahatma, who was at that time 77 years old, replied, you don't know the joy it gives me. So anyways, I just thought, I just want to emphasize this because this was something that was important to him his whole life. And it actually, it's, it's not something that was just personal. It was something that was social as well, because it was also concerned about sanitation. And, you know, all, a lot of great reformers in the history of the world were concerned about sanitation. So Charles Dickens, he had worked on sanitation issues in London. And, you know, they caused, sanitation issues actually caused a lot of death. So it, it had a, lot, a social context as well. Um, in terms of it, uh, um, I want to talk a bit now about um, the struggle for independence and his uh, fight for freedom for the untouchables. Um, in, in South Africa, before we go on to India, in South Africa, there were there was all sorts of discrimination against Indians. For example, uh, there was they were required to uh, registrate and ha have their fingerprints uh, taken, and Gandhi had started launching Satyagraha campaigns against this in 1908. But then in 1913, there was this great Satyagraha campaign, and it involved the issue of a head tax. So there was a head tax placed on Indians, and so he, and so he fought this. And it was the prototype for his mass-based uh, Satyagraha campaigns in India. And so it started here in South Africa in 1913. Um, Castor Bay, his wife, was even involved in a female flying squad. There was like a, a strike, a minor strike that spread to hotel workers. Uh, and for the first time in his life, Gandhi found himself the leader of a mass movement. It was, it was at this time that he changed his, uh, his garb and he wore the clothes of indentured laborers. So he stopped wearing Western clothes. 
he 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 had a the 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 strikers he let he was part of a, a major march with the strikers and then it ended up at a rally and the rally sort of crowned the march and there was like 6000 people that attended the the rally and so that was the largest crowd he ever faced but as you'll see in india there, he gets like tens of thousands and you know hundreds of thousands down the road but you can see he's beginning to build a mass movement can you see this someday for the animal rights movement? Um, you know, Marine Land, that was, that was something, a thousand people. Um, you know, someday, do you think that will happen? Or, you know, in, in Turkey, you know, the po I posted something on Facebook, and I know John said he was, you, you sort of were impressed by the fact that in Turkey, they had tens of thousands of people protesting for animal welfare, like reform, because of, uh, it was mainly related to dogs and cats. But still, that's something. So the point is, this, this history is important because we can get there too for animal rights. We can get, you know, starting with 6,000, but in, in, then when in India, then he, he had even hundreds of thousands of people at, at rallies. Um, with respect, moving on to this issue of um, untouchables, I, I want to emphasize this a bit because, in, you know, in some ways it's how animals are treated, right? Um, and there was... Uh, one leader in, uh, South, in India, his name was M Ambedkar, who was from that class. And it was unusual for somebody from that class to actually have assume leadership position, uh, leadership position. And he said that this issue of, you know, Brahmins and untouchables and so forth was not religious nor philosophical, but sociological. He goes, for century, India maintained itself, it, its system of exploitation um, based on sort of uh, giving menial work, hard and menial work that uh, to, to the sudras who were at the bottom, the untouchables, and, reap the, and, and then the brahmins were those that reaped the benefits at the top. So it was just given a mask of, oh, this is a religious, uh, you know, there's religious reasoning for this, but no, it was just, you know, it served a social purpose, a class purpose. And um, there was a clear analogy between untouchability in India and slavery in the U.S. And I think it's very relevant to animal exploitation. Um, so, in so, so just moving on in terms of some of the campaigns that he launched uh, in, in, in India, um, he had set up an ashram and... Um, he, he, when he returned to India, he first worked with indigo planters. And in the movie Gandhi, you probably remember that. Again, based on his experience with the indentured laborers in South Africa, he, had, he, he empathized very strongly with the poorest. And so he had started with those campaigns, and then he was involved in a mill strike. But he's, of course, he's most famous for the Salt March, which happened in 1930. And it started with 78 satragahis starting at his ashram, uh, which was in Gujarati state, the state in which he was born. And so they went on a 24-day march on foot for the coast of Dandi, which was uh, 390 kilometers away. Um, so basically he said that was less than 12 miles a day, which was child play for him, like w walking that distance. And so they left on... Uh, March 12th, 1930, and then they arrived uh, at the coast uh, April 5th, 1930. Um, what's interesting about this particular uh, Satyagraha campaign is that there were, they were ha there were 6,000 separate, separate Satyagraha actions throughout the country during that time. So largest on the continent. And... Um, I th there were there were a hundred thousand people in jail as a result of that Satyagraha campaign. Okay. The other thing I wanted to emphasize is that uh, when you think of the concept of bearing witness, um, in his historically it has been related to sacrifice and self-suffering, and it's something that Gandhi said was an important thing to do. It, it, it involved courage and. It, and, and Tolstoy emphasized that as well. It so did before him um, abolitionists. And in our Western society, we often look down on sacrifice or it's not something that's held up as a value that, that is a good thing. 
but it but it actually there's an important role for sacrifice and 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 we should consider when we're working for important issues like animal justice that sometimes you need to sacrifice in order to help others so in the case of you know the satyagrahi campaign it often meant going to jail and you know suffering economic losses suffering beatings and and, and or you know and going to jail and so forth um so I wanted to, so the SALT march, as I said, was a, a key, it was sort of like a highlight in, the, in the, the fight for independence. I would now want to go back to the Satyagraha campaigns, or sorry, I want to go back to his campaign to fight for freedom for untouchables because he spent most of the 30s working on that issue. So he set up a paper called Harajan newspaper. Harajan means um, children of God. So he just renamed the untouchables that name. Uh, and today in India, Dalits is used. Um, he he took on the cause of social reform and in particular engaged in community organizing. So he would go from one village to another. Uh, mostly poor villages had untouchables. And he would do three, four, five speeches a day, six days a week, uh, except Mondays, which was a day of silence for him. So I just wanted, again, to put this in context. So three, four, five speeches a day. How many people in the animal rights movement do you know that do three, four, five speeches a day? Go village to village, village to village, you know. It just, in India, it's not unusual. Like, if you look at the, I think Paul was reading a book on dam, anti-dam activists. Yeah, yeah. And they worked around the clock. Like, they would sleep a few hours to go village to village and give speeches. Like, talk about dedication. Because, you know, a lot of us say, oh, aren't you dedicated? Look how much you do. Like, or Travel like, is very difficult. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, pig safe, we do three vigils a week. You know, one and a half hours, two hours each vigil. That, you know, they did, he did three, four, five speeches a day, six days a week, except Mondays, which was a day of silence to reflect. And then um, King, Martin Luther King, he also had a day of silence, too. He tried to do that as well, to reflect on the movement. But I just wanted all of us to look at history and how much people worked for social change. And there's so much more we could do. Let's just put this in context. Because we have a lot of time, we have resources, and we have a lot of privilege, and we spend it mostly on ourselves and, you know, enjoying ourselves. And even in the animal activist movement, we do. And it's, and it's hard because if you look at society as a whole, they ignore this issue that we see. But the point is, all I'm trying to say is that we can do a lot more. And, it, and we have wonderful inspirations, um, such as Gandhi and... Uh, I'm, I'm emphasizing him, but you know it's a movement full of thousands and thousands of satyagrahis. Okay. Okay. So, um, in terms of the crowds he drew, remember in South Africa, his the highlight was the thing that crowned his experience there was the fact that he had six thousand people at, in Durban at a rally. Okay, now in India, he has 100,000 people in Calcutta coming to his rallies, 30,000 in Madras, 50,000, 25,000, dozens of other cities as he's going from one city to another. And at this point, he was doing fundraisings, fundraising for the Har Har Harajan, or the untouchables. He would ask people, he would sort of target uh, women with jewelry. And sorry, this is hard to repeat, and it sounds really strange, but... Gandhi tried to forcibly remove jewelry from women. So, um, and he refused to get out of his car until he received sufficient funds. Um, so he would have a goal, because, you know, the untouchables, they, they were like starving. They were living so poorly and people had money. So he was saying, he, he took the issue really seriously. Uh, um, so anyways, after his six-week tour and raising money for the untouchables, he, uh, he engaged in a fast. And then in 1934, he retired from the Congress Party, the Indian Congress Party, and then went to live in a village with untouchables and set up an ashram there. It was uh, what he called a village of service. Um, so he spent the next eight years doing this. Um, and it was called Sevagram Ashram. And it was one of the poorest parts of India. Um, I think it, uh, here I have it, it was, uh, I think it was east of uh, Bombay. I'm not absolutely sure. Um, I'll have to check back. Um, so 
here he launched a campaign of uh, village work and he went from village to village. And he wanted to create what he called a service village where, and also encourage appropriate technology such as spinning. Um, and, and, and I just wanted to quote from uh, one of his biographers, Arthur, Arthur Herman. He says, therefore, he, he, Gandhi, decided at age 66, like Tolstoy before him, to live like a peasant. His first house at Sevigram was only a mud wall hut 40 by 29 feet. And many people lived in the hut with him. And, and Castor Bay, his wife, again, there, there was a, a dispute because she felt very uncomfortable sharing a hut with so many people. So they had to build her a separate house. Uh, so, um, okay, let me just see this. Okay, so just finishing up on Gandhi, um, one of the principles he emphasized is nonviolence and turning the other cheek. And I have a couple of poignant quotes here. Revenge is sweet, but forgiveness is divine. And to truly be nonviolent, I must love my adversary and even love him when he hits me. And certainly that's what happened in the case of the Satyagraha campaigns in India. You'll remember scenes from the movie Gandhi where they were being hit, but they just took the hits. And certainly that happened with a salt march when they were being beaten. Some of them fell unconscious and two people actually died in the salt campaign, salt march campaign without heading back. And General Smuts was one of his opponents. He was the, in, in South Africa, and he said to Churchill, he is, Churchill didn't, very, didn't like Gandhi very much, but Smuts, General Smuts sort of appreciated Gandhi, and he said to Churchill, Gandhi is a man of God. You and I are mundane people. I just thought that was funny. But, um, okay, so now going on to King, and you'll see that their lives are sort of parallel each other in many ways in terms of philosophy. And so I just wanted to start with the Montgomery bus boycott, which was in 1955. Um, and as I said, uh, Montgomery was the place that uh, they de he decided to move because um, he wanted to preach at a church in the South where there was segregation. And they had used economic non-cooperation, which was bus boycott, to achieve their goals. And once the, uh, so they, uh, blacks would refuse to take support the bus companies and refuse to ride on the buses. And eventually there was also a Supreme Court decision which declared that uh, the Montgomery laws that required segregated buses were unconstitutional. Um, one of the things I want to highlight is that this, so this was in the 19, mid 1950s. Um, as I said, to, um, King was strongly influenced by Gandhi. And um, in 1959, he actually took a trip to India and he visited um, the ashrams that uh, Gandhi had set up. And he was very much impressed with Gandhi's emphasis on turning the other cheek of the salt march and building a mass movement of the Gandhian Buddhist principle of love. So after... After uh, King's uh, home was bombed, he said, uh, Martin Luther King's home was bombed, he said, love your enemies and let them know you love them. So even his reaction, instead of being, you know, an eye for an eye, he de-escalated the situation by saying that. So, so basically the idea of turning the other cheek means if you, if you are hit, don't hit back. If they curse you, don't curse back. Um, so then there was the Birmingham campaign. And as I mentioned before, Birmingham in Alabama was the most segregated city in the United States. And, uh, the Southern Christian Leadership Convention, the group that King was involved with, in with launched a project called Project C. <clears throat> C st stands for confrontation. Basically it was a direct action campaign and they marched to city hall and it also involved an economic, economic measure, such as a boycott of downtown merchants. And they launched this around Easter time because that was the second business, busiest time in terms of sales. What's interesting in both Gandhi's and King's campaigns is that there was always economic pressure that was brought to bear. 
in order to force the, uh, the other side to negotiate. And I think that's something we need to learn in the animal rights movement is how do we bring economic pressure to bear on supermarkets and other places. Once we become more sophisticated, we will do secondary boycotts. We will do boycotts and bring economic pressure on if Dominion is buying uh, animal flesh from slaughterhouses, specific slaughterhouses, we can, we can sort of start putting economic pressure on them by asking consumers not to shop there. Or, you know, we have, we have to think it through because in both Gandhi's and King's campaigns, um, economic cooperation played a huge role. So I think the animal rights movement has to do more on that front. Um, the Birmingham campaign is famous also for the reaction it got from Bull O'Connor. He would set dogs loose on kids, you know, the ki children protesters. He would use hoses and uh, he, would, he would have these hoses mounted on, uh, on tripods and they would, they would uh, shoot really high pressure water on, on protesters. The pressure was so high that it could actually peel bark off a tree. So it's very dangerous. And, um, and, and so King said, we present our bodies as personal witness. So I, I like this concept of bearing witness where, you know, they're, they're using their bodies as, as, as personal witness uh, of the injustices of racism and segregation. Okay, and then King also said that in any nonviolence campaign, there are four basic steps sort of gathering the facts, negotiating. And again, as I mentioned, you know, um, often you need to be, bring pressure to bear on the opponent in order for there to be negotiations. There's also self-purification, so it might involve fasting. So in the case of King, in the Birmingham campaign, there was a point where, where rocks were thrown by uh, black teenagers back at the, you know, at the, at the firemen who were using the hose. And then he, it was very controversial, but he actually stopped the campaign for a day and, um, s and said there needs to be self-purification because he wanted a non-violence campaign. And, you know, and Gandhi did the same thing. When there was sectarian violence between Hindus and Muslims, he would go on fasts or if there was violence that was used. And Cesar Chavez did the same thing later in the United Farm Workers. When there was violence used, he would go on a fast as a, as a self-criticism of the movement in order for the movement to stop using violence. But is vegan being... Um, yeah, so self-purification could mean all the things I talked about at the beginning about focusing on self. So like being a foot soldier, do it, you know, contributing to the movement by cleaning up and, you know, just playing a role. Uh, just, it's about humbleness and just like playing, playing, like really appreciating the idea of equality. So I think it means a lot of those things, but certainly diet is a key part. So like vegan is like a, in yeah. Yeah. But I mean, but I think this applies across the board. So even in animal rights, it means like focusing on the self in terms of, uh, you know, being a team player, being a foot soldier, you know, doing the equivalent of cleaning the latrines, whatever that is. Uh, I think it's all those things. And, uh, yeah, and also it is... those things are vegan in a broader, more philosophical sense of vegan. Uh, vegan is a nonviolent lifestyle extending to boycotting circuits, um, rejecting vivisection. And wouldn't that also mean uh, nonviolence in relation with others as well? in the broader sense. I think you're right about, yeah, so as David Stiebel said, um, so self-purification would also me, be, mean um, being nonviolent. So if there, and, and being nonviolent in the movement, and if there is violence, what they would have done, these leaders, was they would engage in uh, fasts in order, and just stop the campaign until that was addressed and apologize for the violence. Um, and then finally, direct action. And direct action could be anything from non-cooperation with evil, such as economic boycotts and civil disobedience. Um, so a couple of quotes from, from King. Are you able to accept lows without retaliating? Um, and one of the last campaigns that he worked on, 
And in fact, he was, as many of you probably know, he was murdered, I think at the age of 39 in uh, Memphis, uh, when he was working with sanitation workers, because they, they were on strike. There were uh, 1,300 that were on strike. And they had a dangerous job, and they weren't paid very well. And he said, and I love this quote, because this is actually, I hear these ideas in the animal rights movement a lot. The question is not, if I stop to help the sanitation workers, what will happen to me? The question is, if I don't stop to help the sanitation workers, what will happen to them? So in this case, just put animals there. Because a lot of people say, you know, what will happen to me if I bear witness? You know, it's very painful, it's very difficult, it's very hard. But I think the question is really is, what will happen to animals if we don't help them? You know, and if we don't sacrifice? Yes, it is, it's not easy getting, you know, post-traumatic stress or whatever, but imagine what they're going through. It's just unimaginable. It's unfathomable. And uh, the question is not about us. It's about, like, imagine what happens to them if we don't help, if we don't help them. Um, one of the things that was the last campaigns that he was working on, and some people think this might be related to the, fa the reasons that he was assassinated, was the uh, Vietnam War. And he got a lot of flack for speaking out against the Vietnam War. And I like this quote as well, because uh, he didn't start working on it till uh, around 1966, even though it was something that was raging already in the early 60s. And he says, whether right or wrong, I had for too long allowed myself to be a silent onlooker. So often I had castigated those who by silence or inaction condoned and thereby cooperated with evils of racial injustice. Had I not again and again said that the silent onlooker must bear the responsibility for the brutalities committed by the Bull Connors or, the, or, or by the murderers of innocent children in, in a Birmingham church? Had I not committed myself to the principle that looking away from evil is an, in effect a condoning of it? Those who lynch, pull the trigger, point the cattle rod, or open the fire hose act in the name of the silent. I had to therefore speak out if I was to erase my names from the bombs which fell over North, over North or South Vietnam. I really like that last line because somebody related that to the civil, to the animal rights movement. If you are to erase your name from the slaughterhouses, you, you have to speak out. And he was saying by remaining silent when, you know, napalm was used against children and forests and animals and South, in, in, in Vietnam, and um, there was carpet bombing and, you know, uh, anyway, so he, he said not speaking out, it's his name was on those bombs. And I think the same is true if we don't speak out against slaughterhouses, like our names are on, on you know, the killing facilities. Um, and that's, uh, and what, when there was the March on Washington in um, 1965, uh, Maybe it was, sorry, 64. Um, Marlon Brando, when he was on stage, he, he pulled out a, a cattle prod because uh, police had actually used this on black protesters to, uh, when they were marching. Um, so I wanted to circulate this. Uh, Toronto Pig Safe bought this. It cost us like $160. We bought it from a farm store. It's a real electric prod. I took out the batteries. There's six batteries here. But this is actually used against pigs. And it's basically an instrument of torture. It's an evil instrument. And when I first saw it, I just, you know, it's, it's awful. But this is what they regularly use. And, I mean, I haven't tried it on myself, but it, I, I would have to first investigate how, what the power is and what it would feel like. But it's, it's scary. So I just wanted to circulate it so you all can bear witness. So Marlon Brando, when he was on, when he was at the March on Washington, on stage, he actually, sh he brought one and showed people. This is what they're using against black protesters. And, you know, he didn't mention that, oh, this is what they use against cattle and other animals. So I'll just circulate that so you can see. Um, so just to tie it in with slaughterhouses, Toronto has five slaughterhouses. And just before I go over them, how many people know of these five slaughterhouses or one or more of them? So, okay. So most of you do. Do you, um, we have done vigils at four of them, but not the fifth. The fifth is uh, Chai, Chai Kosher Chicken Slaughterhouse. They kill 10,000 chickens a day. And they're on uh, Lakeshore, 
Uh, more on the east end? That would be nice. Um, well, we'll look into that. So hope that would be nice. Um, well, Johnny said that he thinks it's closing. We'll look into that. Yes. So we'll look into that. Um, but right now they kill 10,000 a day. Um, so now I'm just going to go very quickly because I, I don't know what the time is because uh, I know I want there to be discussion. So I'm now I'm just going to go quickly over what our group does. And basically we started with vigils on Lakeshore and Strawn right by the Prince's Gates at, at the exhibition. It's a very, there's a lot of traffic there, you know, during rush hour. So if you stand there for two hours during rush hour, you know, thousands of people get to see you. And if you go there in the morning, do a early morning vigils, for two hours, you're likely to see 10 trucks on average. So quality meat packers kill 6,000, as the previous slide, 6,000 pigs a day, sorry. Most of them are babies, four to six months old. Pigs have a similar lifespan to dogs. So imagine a, you know, a truck full of puppies that are four to six months old. So they're killing children or puppies. And pigs have the intelligence of three-year-old children. Um, so we started there, and then we also do vigils in front of uh, uh, quality meat packers. And, and uh, sorry, pigs have greater intelligence than us in ways that we could never attain. For example, olfactory intelligence. They can come to conclusions about buried root vegetables from far away just from their nose. That's not just blind smelling, but inferring with an intelligence that we can never have. Hmm. That's right. That's a good point, David. Thank you. Um, and then uh, the third vigil we do, we, we sort of, I made a promise to the pigs that I'd do three vigils a week. That was uh, in July 2011. And we've done that since then. So even if it's like the Christmas holidays or New Year's, it doesn't matter. We do, we do, we've kept our promise. If one week we do two vigils, then the next week we'll do four. So we've always done three a week since July. And that's a minimum commitment. And it's not a big sacrifice, especially if you look at the context of, you know, Gandhi's campaigns and King's campaigns. And in fact, we should do way more. And I'm hoping that our movement grows bigger so we can do more vigils um, and more outreach and vegan outreach. Basically, the save movement, pig save, cow save, chicken save, although we haven't really, um, we haven't done a lot of vigils for chicken save yet. Basically, we, we have four main strategies, and that is one, the use of art and social media. The second, which is our main strategy, is bearing witness. Third is community organizing, which I think is going to be really important in terms of building our movement. And the fourth is developing a, ma a sustained mass mass movement. That's our goal. How do you build a mass movement? That's the dream. Sorry, some of the pictures went away. So beginning with art, uh, there's a quote by Romain Roland, who was a vegetarian and a Nobel laureate in 1915 for, for uh, literature. And he was a very progressive man. He was a pacifist during World War I, where that was clearly the right position. He set up the first global vegetarian association. And in the 1920s, he set up an anti-fascist league. So he was always very progressive. He, uh, he wrote biographies of people he considered role models. So he wrote a biography on Tolstoy, Gandhi, Ramakrishna, Vivekananda, and others. And I had read all his biographies before Pig Safe started, and that partly what inspired me because he fo focused on how they engaged in community organizing when there was an injustice. So there's a quote from him from his book called The People's Theater. Again, another progressive idea. How can you use theater that isn't um, for the affluent, but is for the people which, and promotes social justice? So he, in this book, he says, but in art, it is not necessary to combat evil with evil, but with light. The evil that is seen face to face, the evil that is conscious of being seen, is more than half conquered. And I think that's what we do with our slaughterhouse campaign, if you use a love-based approach. And that's what Sue Ko does in her art, like bearing witness and, and shedding light on what's happening. Um, and uh, uh, this is from a recent book, Cruel. Uh, so we use art. So this painting is by Twyla Francois. She's currently the chief investigator for Mercy for Animals Canada. And she's also a very talented artist, and that's Wilbur. Um, from Charlotte's Web. Um, one of the photographers that helped us a lot when we first started our group is Joanne MacArthur of We Animals. Um, so we just started and she right away put us in contact with Sue Coe who gave us $7,000 worth of prints 
so we still have a lot of her artwork. And then Joanne MacArthur donated a bunch of cards when we first started so we could sell to raise money for our group. And then there's Caitlin Black. Um, she asks us, what can I do for you? Like that's like the ideal social movement artist, which approaches a, a group and says, how can I use, how can I do some art that will help your campaign? And she wrote a, a graphic novel and these are some of her signs and puppets. Uh, that's my mom who, who passed away last July, but she, she was very supportive of the movement. And there are, so when we first started a campaign, our, our, I don't know what you want to call it, our, the theme that we used was thumbs down to pig slaughter. So it was mildly negative messaging. So now we've even ditched that message. Now it's mostly like very positive, like why love one and eat the other. We just noticed that it attracts more at this point. I'm not saying it's not an approach to use. I'm just saying, it, in terms of what we're doing, the, the, like the love for pigs, that sort of, it just, uh, it's, it's worked well in our community outreach. We've done uh, events around the unroyal winter unfair, agricultural winter unfair. Uh, again, Caitlin doing some amazing art, a ring of exploitation with like all the piglets and full of blood. Here is a poor calf being stolen from its mom, unroyal treatment of farm animals. A recent artist that has helped us out is Adina Raz, and she's done a banner for us, which we will get printed soon. Again, emphasizing why love one and eat the other. When we first started, we did a, a tricks of the trade workshop series. And the idea was to democratize art and art and skills of, of, uh, of the arts world. And it's named, this tricks of the trade workshop series was named after a series that Dario Fo He's an Italian artist, communist, uh, Nobel laureate uh, writer who, who, who did a series called Tricks of the Trade in order to empower the working class and others to, so that they would all have skills to, to, to do art. And so Toronto PicSafe did that the first year. And we're going to do that again. So at the last Earth Festival, we had a photography workshop. And down the road, we're going to get Michael Sizer to do a video workshop. So Every time we do a festival in the park, we're going to do a workshop which can give you skills, whether it's photography or video uh, or some other art or puppet making or acting, whatever it is. We, we want to incre incre increase those skills because they're so important to our movement because art plays, it's, it's very inviting. You know, it's a, it's a good way for people to come to our movement because people like to see art and it's a powerful way of expressing issues. Um, so one thing I wanted to plug here today was lynda.com. So it's spelled L-Y-N-D-A.com. I watch courses on it every day. And you get the first, I don't know, a week or 10 days free. But it has courses on photography, on Photoshop, on uh, video, on screenwriting, everything. Design, uh, WordPress, on and on and on. And then it costs $25 a month after that. I can't recommend it highly enough because I, I took courses at like Ryerson on documentary filmmaking for $500. If you order this for a year, it's like 250 because you get two, two months off, two months free. So I just wanted to emphasize this because I think we all need to increase our multimedia skills in order to get the word out on animal justice. So bearing witness is what we do. As I mentioned, we do three uh, vigils a week. Um, we started with just doing pig save vigils, three vigils a week. Now we do one cow save vigil a week at St. Helens and Riding Regency. I can't encourage you guys enough to come. And I'd like to show one, one video, um, or at least part of it, uh, shortly. And um, I just wanted to highlight the Tolstoy quote, which is from his book called The Calendar of Wisdom. And I recommend this book for all of you. He considered it his most important book. And he wrote it close to just before his death. And it was a, a collection of quotes, a lot of them from Eastern religion and Eastern philosophy. Some of his own quotes are here. And this is a quote he had in the book. When I found it, like I was just so amazed. I thought, wow, this is like the best, or one of the, it's, it's one of the best uh, definitions of bearing witness. And he said, when the suffering of another creature causes you to feel pain, do not submit to the initial desire to flee from the suffering one, but on the contrary, come closer, as close as you can to him who suffers and try to help him. Isn't it like if everybody did this for every human being and every animal, wouldn't the world be a beautiful place? So whenever there's an injustice, any, anyone suffering, you go there, you go very as close as you can and you help. 
I mean, it's a, it's a very important principle. And that's what, to me, that's what bearing witness is. And that's why I said our group, pig save and cow save, do partial bearing witness, because we only, we see the trucks and they still go to the slaughterhouse. It's not like we're stopping them. And it's so, it really hurts because the pigs and the cows and the other animals go to slaughter. And it's very painful. That's because it's a partial form. And I wanted to highlight the two principles, deontological versus utilitarian philosophies. A deontological approach is you do the right thing every second, every moment. So a deontological approach is if you see a truck full of animals, innocent animals going to slaughter, you would stop that truck and free it and stand in front of it, do whatever you had to. So if you imagine if Jesus, as a human being, I don't mean as a religious figure, but as a human being, or, or Buddha, again, as a human being, or uh, was alive today, would they sort of make a utilitarian ca calculation saying, oh, you know, I'm, I'm going to stand here and try to get more people to go vegan. I'm not going to help those individual pigs, but at least they haven't, they didn't die in vain <clears throat> because <clears throat> they're, ra they're helping me raise awareness about the injustice of it all. No, maybe they would do more. Maybe they would just say, this is so wrong. They would stop the truck, climb on the truck, you know, free them, whatever. I'm just saying that there's another approach called deontological. And it might seem outrageous here in Toronto, but in China, people are doing that with respect to truck, transport trucks carrying dogs and cats. They actually, a crowd of people, animal activists, surround a truck and they free the animals. And they do whatever they have to, even if it has to have to pay $1,600 or whatever, they do what they have to do to free them. That's a deontological approach. And, um, you know, someday that will happen here. When we have a mass movement, it would just be unacceptable to have a truck full of cows or baby sheep or, you know, lambs or, or, or four-month-old pigs going to slaughter. It's unacceptable. And that someday that will happen. And I, I wanted to um, end with this quote before I show you the movie. Uh, just before this cl class, uh, we did a short film with Michael and Paul on the question of um, stress the stress that animal activists feel, you know, just the stress of being an activist and post-traumatic stress and all that. And, but there are, we also talked about the positive things about being an activist. And I, I wanted to quote Ramakrishna and he said, but my heart has grown much, much larger and I have learned to feel the suffering of others. So in other words, when you become an activist, your heart actually gets bigger. And um, it's a very positive thing. Look, look how strong Gandhi and King were. They saw so much injustice but they just, their heart just became bigger and bigger. And, and that they, they had a very meaningful life. Isn't that something we all want, a meaningful life? And I think there's so much positive in being an activist and doing the right thing and living your life in that way and you know, contributing to the social good and trying to promote justice. So I, I think overall, it's the best thing you can do. And it's absolutely the necessary thing. It's what we must do, but, it, but also from a deontological position, it's something we should do every day, every second of our lives. Always do the right thing. Um, I wanted to show you uh, a bit of this cow safe movie. And I, I don't know if, uh, Michael, you're going to show if this. I'd like to, yeah. Okay. So um, do I get sound here or I'm not going to get sound? No, there's sound. Okay. Okay, sorry. I just have to stick it into your computer. Okay, in this movie, it just shows a vigil at uh, Toronto Cow Safe, and it highlights in particular Mary Fantaski, who's currently at Animal Place Sanctuary in California, as we speak. But she's a Toronto activist who has volunteered at sanctuaries, but she was at this vigil along with others like Antonia, and there were a couple of other people. And so I'll just show you the what what bearing witness looks like. <laughs> 